Welcome to the Hieroglyph. In this presentation, I hope to bring to light the great error that is incarcerating wild animals by demonstrating how it affects not just them, but us too, and the entire ecosystem at large. Hopefully, this will be a starting point in our understanding of our place in nature, an understanding that we seem to have long lost, which may help us create a better Gaia for all living in it. I invite you to come along. Kinta decided to visit Sekabubo of Kiagwi first, but as he set off, nature called and he took a detour to the back of his quarters. As he watered the back of an acacia, a cobra rose on his left. In the corner of his eye, he saw it spread its neck, brandishing a thorny tongue. Kinta's leek died. The cobra rose higher, and shiny black scales glistened in the sun. A pattern, cube-like, on its throat wavered from left to right as it moved its head. Kinta waited until it stopped dancing. He then lifted his right foot and sat it softly on top of the left foot to keep still and look like a tree. The snake swayed belligerently again. Kinta closed his eyes and remained still. Kinta did not know when the serpent lost interest. When he opened his eyes, it was gone. Sometimes I wish I could be living in those times when wild animals just walked free. You are strolling in the forest with your mate and then you spot a rattlesnake passing and you just stand still and hold your breath and wait for it to pass, rattling. A moment of silence to respect the elder of the earth who knowest most and teacheth us much. Then when it's gone a distance, you take a deep breath and resume your chatter. That's the life before the river lost its course. I bet if animals had the capacity, they would be protesting against these lockdowns we have imposed on them. On our part, it just shows how we need to lock up and control nature in order to progress. Or does it expose our hidden sadism of deriving pleasure from viewing creatures as they agonize helplessly in the cages we have put them in? It's hard at this point not to call to memory that not long ago we used to lock up human beings who we thought would be an interesting piece to look at. But I wonder, if primitive man could manage to live with wild animals amongst themselves with ease, why is it so hard for the advanced civilized man? We are the first society in history to lock up wild animals extensively for the sake of our convenience and entertainment. Oh, we have to lock them up for man's society to thrive. Okay, cool. We seem to want to tame everything first before letting it into our civilized society. Those we can't tame are either in zoos, game parks, prisons, or psych wards. If you want to be outside the cage, you have to toe the line, or if you are a lion, paw the line. There's an Indian guy who took a table and chair and sat to work in a cage full of poisonous snakes. His point? To prove that these animals are harmless and less provoked. I think he went too far to demonstrate the point but perhaps it would require going that far to make the arrogant, self-declared, civilized man see the point. I just think that it does not have to be this way. We do not have to lock up animals to live in peace. I think there is some knowledge that we used to have about dealing with nature, or rather wild animals, that we have since lost, necessitating that we lock them up. In the savannas of Africa, for the longest time, People live together with wild animals, and even today still do, for those parts that are still far from civilization. The pastoralists with their herds live in the same lands that are roamed by lions and leopards. There was no need to erect a miles-long fence around some land and designate it as a game park where animals live and can't leave, or is it can't live. Today there are such kinds of fences almost everywhere to contain the wild animals. And the ones that are not very lucky are in small cages. If you watched Avatar, you probably noticed that the wild animals in Pandora weren't in any way locked up or fenced out, and the Navi people had ways of relating with those wild animals without any party stepping on the other's toes or paws. Don't misquote me, however, I haven't said to release snakes and lions into town streets. You can't imagine a cobra slithering along that boulevard next to the city square, or a lion resting at the public park. 
wouldn't it ruin the fun if real Lions accompanied players and fans in the English Premier League? Just ahead of us, reverse lights go on. With a mother's instincts, my arms reflexively spread to protect them. Be careful in parking lots, I caution. Those white lights mean the car is backing up. Oh! Benson exclaims. It is like when walking among the cows. One must use caution. A cow may swing her head very, very fast to get a fly. The horns, very long, can injure a boy. That must be dangerous. Why don't you remove the horns of the cows? Cows need horn to fight lion. Cliff's eyes widen and he mouths, lions. Real lions? What's more beautiful than an elephant in the wild, in its true self, is it a camera shot, through a mesh? The actual lamentation here is the loss of connection between man and nature. I realize that many of us in this generation can't name and identify wild animals in their localities, beyond the big and very famous ones. If you ask for their names in mother tongue, even a bigger problem. If you ask about the behavior of the animal, well. We only know about cat memes and King Kong. At this point, one has to wonder how effective telling an old grandma fable to this generation would be. Once upon a time, the hedgehog said to the hornbill, what the heck is a hedgehog? Then she continues, as you know, the hornbill is fond of making noises while on the tree, no grandma, we don't know that. There's some Gen Z who came to visit our home, saw turkeys, and asked why we kept ostriches at home. Why were fables a critical fabric of traditional society? If you were to browse African proverbs on the internet, you are likely to make the observation that the proverbs will be, for the most part, backgrounded, out of all things, by images or motions of wild animals. In the wild, in the African savanna. That last part is very important. It might have been subliminal, but close examination reveals that indeed much wisdom is to be found in nature, specifically, for our debate today, in animals in the wild. To the African, and to many indigenous societies, wild nature was an open book of wisdom. It's why fables were such a thing. A friend of mine went to a women writers conference and heard a native woman speak. She said, if you take the Christian Bible and put it out in the wind and the rain, Soon the paper on which the words are printed will disintegrate and the words will be gone. Our Bible is the wind and the rain. There's so much wisdom to derive from watching a cheetah chase a gazelle at top speed, a leopard walking majestically in the wild, a lion lying on the open grassland, a spider weaving a web in the tree, a kingfisher swooping down for a fish, vultures feasting on a carcass, or an owl simply resting quietly on a tree. This wisdom is completely lost when these animals are removed from the wild, or are tamed. Indeed, there's very little to learn from a domesticated animal, compared to their wild counterparts. Taming animals is great, but it's already done for our needs. But, incarcerating animals? Nature is an open book, the only manual that man has. Why close it? By closing, editing or altering this manual, so much is at stake. Nothing is invented, for it's written in nature first. Originality consists of returning to the origin. Antony Gaudi Man cannot teach himself, he is a tabula rasa, the only animal born that doesn't know how to live, it has to be taught. Man, and by extension his society, derives its knowledge and wisdom from nature. So, the tragedy of realigning nature is that by doing so, man is throwing his best teacher into disarray. Disaster for the student. This is also the reason why genetically modifying organisms is a great danger. It's editing the real Bible, the only one we've got. But this is a subject for a future video. The closing of the book isn't the only drawback to caging animals. On its own, it also hurts them, to a great extent, more than many of us would have guessed. 
In such places, where animals are simply penned up, they are almost always more thoughtful than their cousins in the wild. This is because even the dimmest of them cannot help but sense that something is very wrong with this style of living. When I say that they are more thoughtful, I don't mean to imply that they acquire powers of ratiocination. But the tiger you see madly pacing its cage is nevertheless preoccupied with something that a human would certainly recognize as a thought. And this thought is a question, why? 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 The tiger asks itself hour after hour, day after day, year after year, as it treads its endless path behind the bars of its cage. It cannot analyze the question or elaborate on it. If you were somehow able to ask the creature, why what, it would be unable to answer you. Nevertheless, this question burns like an unquenchable flame in its mind, inflicting a searing pain that does not diminish until the creature lapses into a final lethargy that zookeepers recognize as an irreversible rejection of life. And of course, this questioning is something that no tiger does in its normal habitat. At this point, I think it will be fitting to make a comparison between two works that have shaped my perspective on this matter. One is the documentary Blackfish which explores the miserable life of orcas in captivity where they are held for the amusement of people, the second is The Whale Rider, a fiction novel based on the myths of the Maori people of New Zealand. I am convinced that the novel being fiction does not make it any less valid, especially because it is based on a practiced culture and the myths associated with it. These were the vicious killer whales that, you know, had 48 sharp teeth that would rip you to shreds if they got a chance. What we learned is that they're amazingly friendly and understanding and intuitively want to be your companion. Are you recording us? <laughs> and to this day, there's no record of an orca doing any harm to any human in the wild. They're not your whales. They own them. Kasaka and Takara were very close. Kasaka was the mother. Takara is the calf. Takara was special to me. They were inseparable. When they separated Kasaka and Takara, it was to take Takara to Florida. Once Takara had already been stretchered out of the pool, put on the truck, driven to the airport, Kasaka continued to make vocals that had never been heard before. They brought in the senior research scientists to analyze the vocals. They were long range vocals. She was trying something that no one had even heard before looking for Takara. That's heartbreaking. How can anyone look at that and think that that is morally acceptable? It's not. It is not okay. I thought I knew everything about killer whales when I when I worked there. You know, and everything about these animals. I really know nothing about killer whales. I know a lot about being an animal trainer or a killer whale trainer, but I don't know anything about these animals' natural history or their behavior. These are wild animals, and they are unpredictable because we don't speak whale. We don't speak whale. We don't speak tiger. We don't speak monkey. Speak whale. We don't speak tiger. We don't speak monkey. We don't speak monkey. They're not suitable to have The whales are really bored. You deprive them of all this environmental stimulation. I think that in 50 years, we'll look back and go, my God, what a barbaric time. One of the old men was talking to his whale and said in response to his neighbor, well, you talk to your plants. At that point, the whale lifted its head and, staring at the two men, gave what appeared to be a giggle. Why, the whale understands, the old man said. So the word went down the line of helpers. Talk to the whales. They understand. They understand. Once, our world was one where the gods talked to our ancestors, and man talked with the gods. Sometimes the gods gave our ancestors special powers. For instance, our ancestor Pykea was given power to talk to whales and to command them. In this way, man, beasts, and gods lived in close communion with one another. 
The whale is a sign, he began again. It has stranded itself here. If we are able to return it to the sea, then that will be proof that the oneness is still with us. If we are not able to return it, then this is because we have become weak. If it lives, we live. If it dies, we die. Not only its salvation, but ours is waiting out there. If the whale lives, we live. These were the only words Kahu could think of. We have lost we our have way lost of our way to whales. To whales. Its eyes opened, and Koroaparana saw the strength and the wisdom of the ages shining like a sacred flame. The tattoo of the whale too seemed alive with unholy fire. Do you wish to live? Sacred whale, Koroaparana said. Yes, we wish to live. Return to the sea. Return to your kingdom of Tangaroa. Return to your Return kingdom to your of Tangaroa. 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 What the Maori people in the book understand that the people imprisoning Orcas do not is that one, the whales are much much more useful to man, and to themselves and all else, out there in the open oceans where they belong than in captivity. Man is part of nature, not apart from it. He cannot harm nature without harming himself. 2. Is that there is a way of relating with beasts that espouses the equality of both man and beast in their importance. This will be difficult to explain but I will give it a try. Man has dominion over other creatures, but this does not necessarily mean that he owns them, or he is superior to them and can use them in whichever way he pleases. He is like a sort of a king of the jungle, but a king that does not have to rule, because the jungle is already self-sufficient. Consider that man's intelligence enables him to command great beats, and indeed the animals of the jungle submit to him. In the Whale Rider, the legend talks of an ancient whale commandeered by a golden master. In Pandora, the Navi ride the great birds and horses and even untamed wild beasts. In the African savanna, the Maasai who are pastoralists can chase lions and other dangerous carnivores from where their cattle are, and this they do not do by using weapons. Indeed, they can even scare away elephants. The bushmen of the Kalahari occasionally steal meat from predators such as lions by chasing them away from their meal just after they have killed it. I think using those examples is an easier method to illustrate the position that man holds in the system, and how man and beast should relate. And on top of all this, Caging in and fencing out animals prevents them from performing their ecological duties. Every creature has a niche, a duty assigned to it in the ecosystem that it needs to play to keep the system in balance. When barriers and restrictions are placed on the movement and behavior of animals, they are unable to perform these duties, which puts the ecosystem at risk. The ways through which this happens may not be very apparent to man, and no amount of studying the wild can be enough to understand these interactions. Besides, it is not possible to perform these duties ourselves. Why then do we prevent the ones capable from doing so? In a recent ecological study, it was shown that massive grazing by wildebeest during their annual migrations is necessary to provide a lush mat of grasses that can be eaten by Thompson's gazelles months later. How many other such relationships are there of which we know nothing? When I would come down from Arusha the wardens would take me around and show me the trampled acacias. Next day the scientists, ecologists from the Serengeti Research Institute, would take me out and show me the new acacia shoots blooming in another part of the park. Acacia seeds are carried and fertilized by elephant dung. In conclusion, the disconnect between man and nature causes some form of disorientation. You know that kind of disorientation you will see in the typical urban iPad zombie kid but not in the jungle boy, who lives in wild nature with wild animals and plants. Some wisdom, some astuteness, that's what gets lost when we incarcerate and tame, all wild animals and plants. Oh, plants are in this too. That's also why living in concrete jungles is also a bad idea. Or any world where man is surrounded only by the creations of man, prison slash city. They teach him nothing. No wisdom, no sharpness, no alertness, no calmness, nothing. 
they just disorient him. Man has to be surrounded by wild nature to stay wise, astute, and oriented. A man surrounded by creations of man alone sooner or later runs mad. Among the indigenous, crime, mental illness, suicide, and drug addiction are great rarities. How does this culture account for this? It's the idea that people living close to nature tend to be noble. It's seeing all those sunsets that does it. You can't watch a sunset and then go off and set fire to your neighbor's teepee. Living close to nature is wonderful for your mental health. Here's some food for thought, perhaps this points to the danger of an imminent storm that we think is one of the most novel ideas to happen to humanity, the idea of virtual worlds, to immerse man completely in artificial worlds, totally shut out from nature. One would say that there are trees and rivers in those metaverses, but I reckon that nature cannot be substituted. A picture, a painting can come close to bringing one close to the object being depicted, but can never replace the live experience of being in contact with it, one on one. Well, the idea of virtual reality is promising to hit this target precisely, and we may have to wait to see how it goes. I won't predict doom, but I think we should anticipate it. It could be a prison, albeit a clever one, people entering to look for fun, though in reality, it is a madness generator. This has been the general direction of the media technologies we've had thus far. Man cannot live in a world he creates solely himself. That's prison. Nature is freedom. The freedom. The concept of freedom also brings art to view. Art is an integral part of society, without it, reality would be too heavy to bear, it would crush us. With nature, or us, imprisoned, art is also at stake. In the words of Pierre Bonnard, art will never be able to exist without nature. I still hear echoes of the ground hornbill howling and weaver birds singing and building their nests in the thorny bushes. I would stand under acacia trees and watch the giraffes curl their black tongues around the leaves above. They would glance at me and then ignore me, a little boy who could do them no harm. At night, when screaming hyenas fought lions and awoke everybody, I cuddled close to my mother 